Yesterday, I covered uh, the important aspects about the stretch reflex and inverse stretch reflex. And today, I am taking uh, taking it further uh, with the withdrawal reflexes and um, the cross extensor reflex. Today. Uh, I would revise uh, these uh, three topics uh, of yesterday. In brief, I revise stretch reflex, reciprocal inhibitory reflex, inverse stretch reflex. Then I will add this information regarding whatever the topics I did not cover in the last, yesterday's class. That is the phenomena associated with the stretch reflex. That is uh, muscle tone, spasticity and placidity, the clonus, gendresk maneuver, and um, class phenomena or lengthening phenomena. So these things I would highlight, and uh, each one of them are important in terms of your examination point of view. That is why I am making it a point. Then I will cover the withdrawal reflex, the pathways, functions. Then I talk about uh, the Babinski sign, then I mentioned about a cross extensor reflex and the mass reflex. This is the outline of uh, today's uh, uh, lecture. Coming back with the revision of the uh, stretch reflex, this is also known as a deep tendon reflex. A tab on the patellar tendon here will stretch this quadriceps femoris muscle along with the stretching of the muscle spindle and that will increase the activity of the nerve. This is a group 1A fiber. That makes a synaptic, monosynaptic contact with the alpha motor neuron, which supplies the extra fusal fibers of the quadriceps uh, femoris muscle and results in the contraction of the quadriceps femoris muscle. So that is uh, the st uh, stretch reflex. This is uh, a simple monosynaptic monosynaptic activation and this stretch reflex is altered by the, uh, the descending influences descending influences uh, today i will look into those uh, descending influences uh, in the coming uh, uh, slides then i i mentioned about uh, the because uh, what I was talking uh, in the previous uh, stretch reflex, uh, this the contraction of the quadriceps femoris muscle can be possible if there is a relaxation of the uh, opponent muscle, that is a hamstrings. Now, to relax again, the same uh, input, that input is the stretch resulting from the tapping of the tendon, the stretching the muscle spindle, and that would reach to the through the collateral because this is the primary one which is coming here through the collateral and that would that would uh, activate the inhibitory interneuron inhibitory interneuron and this interneuron which uh, is having a contact with the flexor motor neuron group that is opponent muscle and now this would inhibit this would inhibit the flexor motor neuron by inhibiting the flexor motor neuron this relaxes the hamstring muscle this is known as a reciprocal inhibition reflex the stretch reflex and reciprocal inhibition reflex are the component of one and the same the deep tendon reflex they are the component because the quadriceps have to contract the opposite muscle should relax it, it will happen in all the places wherever you are eliciting the deep tendon reflex. Suppose if you are talking about a biceps uh, reflex or the bicep jerk in this uh, biceps, uh, if the biceps has to contract, the triceps has to relax. So like that, uh, agonist and antagonistic group of muscles, the both the stretch reflex and the reciprocal inhibition are uh, similar to the um, two sides of the so that is a reciprocal inhibition reflex. Like so yesterday, we dealt with the inverse stretch reflex. This inverse stretch reflex uh, is because of the activation of the fibers in the or the activation of the uh, receptors located in the uh, tendomuscular junction. Uh, 
are the ten this is tendon and this is muscle at this tension we have a, a specialized group of um, receptor sensor receptors which detect the tension or force uh, generated by this muscle and if this tension is too much if the muscle is contracted too much as it happens in case of a uh, convulsions in that case the muscle has to be protected from being injured or ruptured so these receptors are activated then then they are carried through a group 1b fibers group 1b fibers so, so these are uh, group 1a fibers in case of the uh, stretch reflex group 1b fiber these require a greater strength or greater these things and that would make a, a disynaptic contact with uh, an inhibitory interneuron is uh, interposed and that means this would activate the inhibitory interneuron and this inhibitory interneuron in turn uh, inhibit the um, uh, motor neuron of the the uh, muscle uh, extrafusal fibers uh, decrease the activity thus it will uh, relax this is what i have mentioned so these these reflexes operate when there is too much tension the stretch reflex is because of the change in the length and uh, the this um, inverse stretch reflex is because of the uh, greater force uh, in the uh, the tenderness uh, area this is what the inverse stretch reflex is going further the phenomena associated with the, the stretch reflex i mentioned in the last class about the clonus the alternating uh, uh, contraction and relaxation happening in a particular frequency so that is the clonic uh, contraction uh, there is also known as a tetanic contraction tetanic contraction is a spasmodic contraction it is a spasm or spasm like these clonic contractions are clonus can be elicited in the uh, clinical setting where uh, this ankle clonus usually the ankle clonus is performed it can be elicited by a brisk maintained dorsiflexion of the foot suppose if this is the foot suddenly you make you make it like this uh, that would activate that would stretch those uh, uh, gastrocnemius uh, muscle and that will uh, initiate the rhythmic plantar flexion of at the ankle so that means it is one of the neurological sign to indicate the upper motor neuron lesion and in this clinic in this clinical sign what is called a clonus Uh, there is a occurrence of a regular repetitive rhythmic contraction of muscle as a result of a sudden maintained stretch of that muscle and to be considered as a clonus you should have more than five such repeated contraction cycles contraction relaxation contraction you should have more than five then only you consider these oscillations are because of the stretch reflex and inverse stretch reflex happening one after another in sequence so that means a stretch reflex produce the the uh, contraction or the force generated in the tendon that would activate the golgi tendon organ and that would initiate the inverse stretch that relaxes it inverse stretch reflex and that relaxes the muscle this relaxation and these things because the oscillations go on so this is the um, this is the phenomena oscillations go on usually normally these are dampened in the spinal cord they increase the gamma motor neuron activity now what happens the gamma motor neuron activity sensitizes the intrafusal fibers now the intrafusal fibers are more sensitive so they will make the uh, they will increase the discharge of the stretch reflex so that that is one of the uh, phenomena so this uh, decreased or uh, increased gamma motor neuron activity is due to uh, the increased uh, descending influences coming from the the medulla and the midbrain so this reticular system the 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 gamma motor neuron activity the facilitatory gamma neuron they are approaching here and they will enhance the uh, or produce this clonus effect 
The clonus is seen in conditions with the increased gamma motor neuron activity from the descending tracts that I explained. Or disruption of the corticospinal tract. So this is because of the disinhibition phenomena, suppression of the inhibitory inputs coming from the corticospinal tract on the motor neurons. This is called a disinhibition. And this disinhibition happens to the Ransa cell. This Ransa neuron is inhibitor neuron to the alpha motor neuron. And uh, that is why the, the clonus. So now I would uh, like to say the balance between the gamma alpha linkage is uh, rather uh, the threshold for a dampening effect is not there. Usually it is dampened or suppressed. This dampening is not there and that results in exaggerated uh, uh, reflex or uh, responses. That is what happens with the clonus. This is one of the important um, clinical sign uh, showing the, uh, the upper motor neuron lesion or that means uh, you have a hemiplegia or uh, uh, the lesions in the corticospinal tract. Now, the muscle tone. What is muscle tone? Muscle tone, we all have a muscle tone. This is the partial state of contraction of skeletal muscle. And it is known as a muscle tone. And uh, whatever reactions uh, you are doing, even when I am switching quietly also, uh, there are certain group of muscles which are in the partial state of contraction, even all muscles, but uh, some muscles are with a greater tone, greater contraction, some are a lesser contraction. This partial state of contraction is known as a muscle tone. Suppose if you cut the nerve, the alpha motor, uh, the ventral root, so then the muscle become flaccid. So that means that that means uh, it is a reflex one generated by the gamma motor neurons. Usually there is a discharge of gamma motor neuron activity coming from the uh, brain stem, and that would uh, increase the uh, muscle spindle activity. That will enhance the one a activity, and which in turn stimulate the alpha motor neuron and uh, produce the tone or a tonus. If the motor nerve to the muscle is cut, what happens? The muscle offers very little resistance. It is floppy. Or, so now it is said to be placid. That's, that is the placidity. Even the dorsal root sectioning, that means, uh, suppose the uh, dorsal root sectioning means the, the sensory fiber 1A activity is coming up. If you cut the dorsal root, uh, that will also abolish the muscle. So that means either a dorsal root sectioning or the ventral root sectioning abolishes the muscle tone. That indicates that it is, an, it is a reflexly originated uh, uh, component. In case of an increased tone, this is what we mentioned as a placid, placid condition. That means the decreased tone as it happens in case of a cutting a nerve, motor nerve. Suppose a hypertonic, because if there is an increased gamma activity, so then that condition, the muscle remains in a state of contraction. That is a spastic, a spastic uh, uh, part where muscle offers resistance to stretch. Suppose you want to stretch it or you want to this stretch it, you are trying to do this thing, you get the resistance that you can feel. You can feel uh, when you are uh, examining for a muscle tone in the clinical setting. And uh, uh, these, uh, these are associated with the hyperactive stretch. So the hypotonic, uh, hypotonic means the flaccidity is uh, there when gamma motor neuron discharge is uh, low or absent. The spasticity is seen in when hypertonic, uh, uh, when there is a high gamma motor neuron Lesions of the corticospinal tract from the motor cortex to the spinal cord, what is called upper motor neuron. Upper motor cortex, there is a uh, pyramidal cell. From there, it descends down and make a monosynaptic contact with alpha motor neuron. And this is known as upper motor neuron lesion. Or increased pontine reticular activity, because this is another posture regulating uh, 
reflexes. Uh, increased pontine reticular activity will increase the muscle tone. This would, uh, both of them would increase the muscle tone. While lesions of the dorsal and ventral root or cerebellar lesions uh, decrease the tone. So dorsal root sectioning I have mentioned or ventral root sectioning I have men I mentioned cutting the nerve or the cerebellum which also which maintains the muscle tone and uh, in the in uh, cerebellar lesions you will, you will get the uh, decreased muscle tone. This is uh, about muscle tone. Now coming back here the placidity and the spasticity. These are the two terms uh, very often uh, you will be uh, coming across. That is why now I have in the beginning itself I want to make you uh, clear about what are these terms. So here is the placidity and the spasticity. I have uh, made certain parameters here. The definition, the placidity is a limping, soft or drooping. So that means when I cut the nerve, it droops down or it limps or it becomes soft. That is placidity. Whereas if you are looking at a spasticity, it is in spasm. That is in a contracted state or it is firm or it is a stiff. That is by definition. Now, if when examining, when we try to examine this thing, the placidity, uh, resistance to stretch is absent. This, uh, uh, whatever the limping or uh, droop down muscle uh, does not offer any resistance because there is no contraction at all. And here it offers a good resistance. That is increased, rather it is increased. The tone, it is the atonia or hypotonia. Absent, the tone is absent in the placid, uh, placidity uh, and the spasticity in this condition, the tone is increased. There is a hypertonia. The lesions, lesions are lower motor neuron. So that means uh, anything either a dorsal root or the ventral root. That is the placidity. That is a placid paralysis. This is because of the upper motor neuron lesion or uh, upper motor neuron region. That is a spasticity. Muscle contractions, absolutely absent. There are no muscle contractions. The muscle cannot contract. Now, the muscle remains in a contracted state. And even you can elicit uh, tendon reflexes, which are exaggerated, which are exaggerated in this situation. So that is what I have mentioned. The deep tendon reflexes are absent here because uh, one part of the reflex arc is uh, about, uh, cut. So that is why they are absent. And in case of this thing, this segmental uh, reflex arc is uh, intact. So the, only the amplification of the response or uh, response is amplified or uh, sensitized. There is exaggerated uh, uh, reflex response. The clonus, that is what I was trying to describe about. It is absent here and it is present. Use normally, uh, we do not in a normal individual, there is no clonus in a normal individual. And the Babinski sign, Babinski sign, because Babinski reflex, uh, I will talk about at the end of this lecture. So, Babinski reflex, uh, it's a reflex of withdrawal reflex or a plantar reflex. And this reflex is absent because the nerve is cut. Uh, because reflex arc is uh, cut or uh, severe. So in case of uh, this the spasticity, uh, Babinski uh, sign is positive, that is extensor. The muscle atrophy is seen here in a placid paralysis because there is a loss of the uh, motor neuron or uh, motor neuron supplying the muscle is cut. And uh, in case of the spasticity, there is no atrophy. Just one word about the, uh, the atrophy in uh, uh, the placid paralysis is because the motor neurons uh, which, are reaching the, which are reaching the muscle, they are also in addition to the neurotransmitters. In addition to the neurotransmitters, uh, they will uh, also uh, give a neurotropic substances uh, at the synaptic level. So these uh, nerve growth factors and other neurotropins, uh, they are uh, reaching the synaptic end. But this is a slow transmission or a slow transport by through a uh, external transport mechanism. They are they are released 
because they are not as a part of the um, uh, junctional transmission neuromuscular junction and transmission they are a part of the maintenance of the uh, neuromuscular junction so now the in the absence of these atrophic uh, or a growth factors uh, there will be atrophy in case of a uh, uh, flaccid uh, paralysis now coming back with uh, another term i used in the yesterday's class class knife effect or a lengthening reaction pocket knife when we try to open the knife when you are opening it there is a initial resistance then after that it gives away so this is known as a clasp knife effect so that means i just read this part the sequence of resistance in the initial part when i am trying to check the check the arm so give when a limb is moved passively or then when it moves at a certain level suddenly it gives up this is known as a clasp knife effect and uh, it resembles because of the pocket knife now why the passive flexion of the joint offers immediate resistance as a result of a structural flex suppose if i am trying to uh, flex it to flex this uh, uh, elbow joint in initial resistance but uh, once the initial resistance it gives away the, that means the extents are relaxed sir and this is known as a uh, the uh, clasp knife effect the initially when i try to bend it there is a resistance and uh, then suddenly it gives away and this is because the when you are trying to bend it it will activate it will activate the golgi tendon uh, uh, receptors of the uh, extensor muscles is here in triceps here triceps sir. and now when they are activated uh, that would give, give away the uh, that will relax the uh, the triceps muscle and the, then uh, it will be easy easy to flex so this is a uh, clasp knife effect it is also known as a, a lengthening reaction lengthening reaction it is also known as a lengthening reaction because it is the response of the spastic uh, muscle to lengthening because this uh, um, because of the increase the gamma activity the alpha gamma alpha linkage is sensitized this phenomena clasp knife phenomena is taking place it is uh, more pronounced in upper motor neuron lesions and in the decelerate animals this is briefly about a, a clasp knife effect and uh, the lengthening reaction then we go back with another uh, event a gendrask maneuver or also known as reinforcement of reflexes here you see a, a person eliciting the knee jerk okay and uh, he, the doctor he has advised the patient to pull the pull the uh, both the hands together with the fingers so this is uh, uh, this is what uh, the gendrask maneuver so that means sometimes whenever we are eliciting the uh, tendon reflexes uh, and the, since the person is conscious uh, and he tries to have those influences the conscious inhibitions uh, so to avoid that conscious inhibitions uh, so what you do is you divert his attention or divert his neural signaling uh, uh, to other things uh, here uh, in in this case he is trying to uh, pull the two hands uh, together like this or this this is okay this can be done for when you are eliciting the uh, tendon reflexes in the lower limb so then when you want to do in the upper extremities you can ask him to clench the teeth you can ask him to clench the teeth because it's again another action there so now this reinforcement phenomena or gendrask maneuver so that is uh, increase the sensitivity of the that um, are increases the gamma motor neuron discharge and that increases the sensitivity of the intrafusal fibers or the muscle spindle and your reflexes would be uh, better uh, or seen or better uh, exaggerated this will increase the sensitivity of the tendon reflexes while eliciting that is the purpose sometimes uh, in the examination you are trying to do it and the the subject is already tired and he does not want to cooperate under such circumstances this would work much much better clenching of teeth or pulling hands apart 
with a strong force while keeping them locked while the reflexes while the reflexes are elicited now the reflexes become brisker and the scene better the maneuver heighten or exaggerate or amplify the lower limb tendon reflexes when you are uh, pulling the uh, hands together but if you are clinching the teeth it is the both uh, the upper extremity and the lower extremity both so this is because of the inhibition of the supraspinal inputs to the reflex arc are uh, uh, diminished so the counter that they are diminished once the inhibitions are diminished so the gamma motor neuron activity enhances the muscle spin spindles uh, are uh, sensitized and that would uh, activate uh, and make the brisk make them brisker it can also help prevent a conscious inhibition of the reflex if somebody wants to uh, somebody is uh, trying to fake by just not uh, showing the contractions uh, you can eliminate that this is gendarmesque manu manual or a procedure this is also known as a reinforcement of the uh, deep tendon reflex now so having uh, said about uh, these four phenomena i have mentioned about uh, uh, four phenomena clonus i mentioned i mentioned about the spasticity i mentioned about the gendarmesque manual and uh, uh, these four four things are the, i mentioned about the flaccidity and the spasticity the four things i mentioned and i they are all uh, related with the their stretch reflex that is why i have put them together uh, after the stretch reflex now uh, now we consider the withdrawal reflex uh, or reflex or reflex uh, here is a hot plate or uh, some uh, uh, thing uh, the person touches this vessel or the heater heating coil this is the heating coil he touches it then what happens you all know when you touch that you will take away the hand you will not keep the hand there on this uh, heating coil so here this one is uh, the it it has a sensory nerve endings uh, that that would activate the sensory nerve endings. what are these type of sensory nerve ending what are these type of receptors these receptors uh, uh, detect the injurious uh, injurious uh, agents because uh, this is injurious or this is noxious this is noxious stimuli this is called a, a noxious stimuli because it is a heat there this heat this heat will be a noxious stimuli and that the noxious stimuli activate the receptors and these the activation of the receptors uh, carry the information to the to the apparent pathways so these apparent pathways are transmitted by the um, the uh, a delta and uh, c fibers uh, or a group 2 uh, 3 4 uh, uh, fibers a delta or c fibers or group 2 3 4 fibers they will reach uh, to the spinal cord layer 2 uh, uh, layer 2 and layer 4 and from the layer 4 uh, they will make a synaptic contact with the projecting neuron this projecting neuron will reach to the thalamus thalamus in the midbrain okay so now this uh, this is a spinal this will ascend as a spinal thalamic tract this will reach across uh, the opposite side and ascend as a spinal thalamic tract this is uh, the main purpose of this thing to send the impulses to the brain about this event okay so now when the if the impulse has to go to the brain and the brain has to think about it and analyze about it and then bring back by that time you have burnt your fingers so to eliminate that there are segmental reflexes the collaterals will reach reach to the uh, reach to the um, this uh, it through the interneuron uh, the muscle the flexor muscles the flexor muscles this is the flexor muscle there so now this would activate this would green one or the activation this would activate the flexor muscles and the flexor muscles contract if you are looking at the flexor muscles the function of the flexor muscle is to withdraw take away take away so that is why the name withdrawal reflex so that means it has to be withdrawn from the uh, site of uh, uh, that injurious uh, stimulus 
So now, now at the simultaneously, what happens? Another collateral uh, will go to the uh, the maybe from this one or another collateral will or uh, inhibit uh, inhibit the antagonist group of muscles. So this is triceps, because uh, if uh, the flexor has to be co uh, contracted, this has to be the extensor has to be inhibited, and uh, the the collaterals are there. This whole uh, networking is available uh, for uh, uh, making uh, the relaxation of the or uh, relaxing the triceps muscle. So now this is a withdrawal reflex, uh, the uh, injurious stimulus, the receptors, the nociceptors, they are, they carry it through the A delta and C fibers or group two, three, four fibers. They reach the spinal cord and in the spinal cord, the primary aim is uh, to reach to the spinothalamic tract, but at the same time, the segmental reflexes are activated and now this will, uh, through an interneuron, activate the flexor group of muscles, that is the biceps here, and then uh, that will uh, withdraw, that will withdraw, hand is withdrawn uh, from this place, that is the thing, and I have mentioned about uh, these things here in this uh, write-up. Look here, the same are the same components uh, I have made. So here is the uh, that fire or a pain or injurious thing, the pain or a thermal stimulus, and the receptors here in the skin. They are carried through the afferents, and these afferents are group two, group three, group four fibers or A delta C fibers, and these are known as a, a flexor reflex afferents. Through the, uh, they will enter the uh, dorsal root, and from the dorsal root, uh, their main purpose is that they will uh, send up uh, as the uh, spinal uh, relay here, and they will send up as a spinal thalamic tract. But in addition, what happens? This would activate. Uh, so look here. This would activate the the excitatory uh, neuron, and uh, that would uh, supply in the flexor group of muscles. The flexor will contract with the draw take. And if the flexors are to be contracted, the extensors to be inhibited, the extensors are inhibited. So you can just see that uh, this is the, uh, the uh, withdrawal reflex. So now again, if we want to see what is happening on the other side, on the other side, the um, extens, uh, the flexors are inhibited there and uh, uh, the extensors are activated. Now, if you are looking at this uh, same withdrawal reflex, I am showing you uh, some other component here. The person has just stepped over this uh, broken uh, uh, glass pieces, the broken bottle there. Now, it, it will stimulate the nociceptors there because this is an injurious uh, uh, thing that would produce pain. And this, uh, the information goes through this uh, group, uh, A delta and C fibers, especially the A delta fibers are the first ones. So now the, the A delta fibers, when they reach here, so now what happens, uh, they would uh, come there and they would uh, activate, they would activate this uh, flexor group of muscles. So this is the flexor group. This is the flexor hamstring muscle and it will activate the hamstring muscle. At the same time, it will inhibit the, the extensor group of muscle. Thus, there is a lifting of the, there is a fraction of the knee, fraction of the knee. And also, if you are looking at uh, looking at this component, the one which is uh, at the ankle joint, again, this will also try to lift the ankle, so that uh, that's also a part of the flexion group. So these two flexor actions, so they operate, uh, they try to withdraw or uh, take the take the uh, limb from the site of injury. Now, if you are if you are looking at uh, this this component, uh, if, you, if you just uh, I'm just coming back, uh, I'm making the uh, this is a flexor that uh, relaxes and this one contracts and the other limb, other limb, suppose if you, if you are uh, trying to take away this limb, other limb becomes like a rigid and a pillar-like structure because it has to bear your uh, weight because if you are withdrawing and if you, it is also withdrawn, you will fall down and it will be rigid-like and that will support your and this will be a cross extensor reflex. I will talk about that.
So now I just read withdraw the reflex is a typical polysynaptic reflex because it involves a number of synapses uh, that occurs in response to a painful or a noxious stimuli. And uh, the response is a flexor muscle contraction. That is why it is a flexor reflex and inhibition of the extensor muscles so that the body part stimulated uh, is flexed and withdrawn from the site of uh, stimulus. Now, uh, what is the purpose of these things? These are protective reflexes, utilizing the flexor muscles. The plantar reflex is a nociceptive segmental spinal reflex that serves the purpose of protecting the sole of the foot. Suppose if somebody scratches, suddenly the, the foot is withdrawn. This is a withdrawal reflex. A stroking of the lateral part of the sole with or stroking or a scratching with some object, sharp objects, uh, produces a, a plantar flexion, a plantar flexion of the so big toe, plantar flexion. Plantar means this is the plantar side, plantar flexion of the toe, and, uh, and uh, then adduction of other toes. Now, uh, this uh, normal response is termed as a flexor plantar reflex. Whereas in some patients, the stroking of the uh, sole produces an extension or a dorsiflexion of the great toe. Now I mentioned this is a flexion there. Now this becomes like this. Then all these toes become fanning. So that means uh, this, this one will uh, be dorsiflexion and the fanning of these things, these are uh, uh, to be appreciated when you come here and we demonstrate. Anyway, so there is a, a fanning of the other toes and a dorsiflexion of a great toe. And uh, this is known as a extensor plantar reflex or it is the uh, positive Babinski sign. And this extensor plantar reflex is seen in upper motor neuron lesions. That is the lesions of the corticospinal tract. Okay, but now move on. So this is what it is, the Babinski sign. Stimulus is noxious. You just see that noxious stimulus. It's, it's giving the sole of the foot. And uh, receptors are nociceptors. Nociceptors present in the sole of the foot. And uh, they are carried by the fibers, A delta and the C fibers. And the center is in the uh, L5 and the SN, uh, S1 spinal segment, the sacral uh, one spinal segment. The response is plantar, the flexion of the toes, and the ankle and knees in normal. You can just see that. So this is the, the flexion of the toes. All the toes are uh, flexed down. These are the flexor reflex. This is the plantar uh, reflexes flexion. This is a Babinski sign negative. You can just see that. In case uh, of the upper motor neuron lesion, you just see that this becomes like this. This is going on like this. And all these toes are uh, uh, fanned out. So now whatever I was trying to impress upon in the previous uh, slide, they are becoming clear here if you look at this uh, uh, picture. So this is a extensor response or it's a positive response. This is a positive response. This happens. Uh, in uh, conditions of upper motor neuron lesion. Okay, and uh, in normal individuals, especially in infants, it is positive. Because the infants, the um, corticospinal tracts are not developed yet. And because of that, you will get the uh, Babinski sign positive. And if you are you are living in the home and you have a baby, you can just try to scratch the thing, not very heavily, and uh, you can see this uh, reflex pattern. In a normal individuals, sometimes uh, it will become positive in a deep sleep. Deep sleep. It will be seen in hypoglycemia, hypoxia, and uh, anesthesia because we are, uh, the, it is almost uh, limiting to the, the interruption of the, uh, the descending uh, pathways uh, to the um, motor neurons. So that is how. So that means I mentioned this is a abnormal response pathology, upper motor neuron lesion. 
and in infants it is it is uh, seen and it is positive in deep sleep and uh, hypoglycemia hypoxia and anesthesia this is about the babinski sign and um, I try to prepare our work on it now we meant i i discussed about a cross extensor reflex i just uh, revise again one more time here so that means that there is a stimulation of a, a noxious uh, noxious stimuli and this noxious stimuli activate or uh, reach this thing and activate the flexor group of muscles here on the same side and you look at this thing on the opposite side it will activate the extensor group so it will activate the extensor group this is known as a crossed extensor reflex and uh, uh, maybe maybe a, in this figure it's much uh, much better here you just see that uh, the uh, the activation this is the uh, nociceptive or a burn or a thermal injury and it is coming here and through these uh, polysynaptic pathways so this extensor is activated the flexor of the opposite side is inhibited so the activation of the extensors this is a, a crossed extensor reflex this is crossed means opposite side the extensor group of muscles are activated on the same side the flexor group of muscles are activated and uh, this crossed extensor reflex uh, is a component of the withdrawal just like a, a reciprocal inhibition inhibitory reflex where the stretch reflex deep tendon reflex produces the contraction of the agonist muscle the antagonistic muscle relaxes similarly withdrawal of the ipsilateral limb and uh, the, the extension of the uh, contralateral limb that is a crossed extensor reflex now the the significance of this crossed extensor reflex has a two two component one uh, to provide a pillar like structure pillar like structure support the body weight so you say for example you are in a locomotion suddenly you put your leg in your splinter or a glass there and then you try to withdraw but your weight has to be there and that is what uh, this that's one and another thing a crossed extensor reflex become a, a component of the uh, the pattern generator the, the lower limb pattern generator is for gait or walking in this walking if one group of muscles are activated on the ipsilateral side the contralateral side another the opposite group of muscles are to be uh, inhibited or activated if a flexor is activated here uh, on this side and the extensor on the opposite side if extensor here the flexors on the side like that uh, there's a cross talking between these two things uh, that may explain about uh, swinging of the uh, arms or uh, even uh, whatever the legs also the movement of the legs uh, to and fro to result in a motion okay so now coming back with the mass reflex mass reflex is not seen uh, usually it is seen in the persons uh, the persons with the spinal cord uh, injury the paraplegic person that is a total transaction or in a spinal animal in this condition a noxious stimuli produces a extensive response that means uh, that means it is a withdrawal of the uh, limb so suppose even if you are trying to elicit the babinski sign or a plantar reflex uh, it will be withdrawn uh, total withdrawal of the limb so you can just think uh, that uh, the this is the fo foot there foot the ankle and the uh, knee and the hip everything is withdrawn that is one component the second component it will excite the autonomic reflexes what are those autonomic reflexes these autonomic reflexes uh, they, that means uh, he, the bladder and the bowel and uh, the ejaculation reflex and the blood pressure fluctuations and sweating all those things are excited so that means uh, the person uh, withdraws from the site that is a mass in mass there will be a spasm 
or a sp spasm-like movement. At the same time, the autonomic reflexes, that means he will, uh, um, there is a, a, a emptying of the bladder, micturation reflex is activated, he passes urine, he passes stool, and there will be ejaculation, there will be a massive sweating, and uh, the blood pressure. And this spread of uh, uh, massive excitatory impulses in the spinal cord. This happens only in a spinal animal or in a person with a, a damaged uh, spinal cord that's a paraplegic patient. Uh, in that case, it's because of the radiation of the stimulus. Now, taking this thing further here, and uh, this thing uh, I'm just taking in these conditions, that means in the spinal lesion, so when the spinal cord is cut, or in a paraplegic person, paraplegia means cutting of the spinal cord at a particular level, maybe above, above T6, uh, thoracic 6 segment. After recovery from the spinal shock, maybe I will explain about that when I come to the spinal. After recovery from the spinal cord, the central excitatory state of the uh, spinal neurons is increased tremendously. This is the uh, spinal neuron. This is increased tremendously. And uh, this increased uh, phenomena is uh, due to the increased sensitivity of the motor neuron. Let us examine that. First, uh, what happens when uh, in these conditions, in the spinal lesions, uh, even eliciting a plantar reflex activates the spinal cord neurons for a flexor spasm. Flexor means flexor of the dorsiflexion here, the ankle, the knee and then uh, the entire uh, body which are drawn from that and along with that autonomic reflexes that govern the blood pressure, bladder and blow well control, seminal vesicle, was difference in sweating are all excited. You will find the blood pressure uh, increase, the bladder emptied, that means the uh, passing of urine, passing of stools and uh, then uh, ejaculation and then uh, sweating. These are seen. Now, why this thing happens? This thing happens because of the increased sensitivity of the motor neuron pool, and this increased sensitivity because of the the this cut, this is cut. The spinal cord is cut, so these neurons are not under the inhibition. They will have their own sensitivity, and we have so here in the A, one, two, one, two, three, three synapses three synapses so that means it is when it is activated this is coming here that means all the three are getting one coming one another usually this is the first one any alpha motor neuron synapse is just monosynaptic and you have a three synapses are activated and here in this in the b setting the same neuron coming here they it will activate another set of neurons there, there is four synapses here and that will activate another set of neuron there are uh, uh, four synapses, but these four synapses having a collateral or a revert back or a reciprocal reciprocal uh, activation. This is a reciprocal activation. You can just see that what is happening. So these uh, reciprocal activation would produce the reverberating circuits. Now let us examine if it is stimulated and if it comes to C and activates this neuron, activates this neuron and activates this neuron and this activates this. And this neuron would activate the another neuron there, and that would activate this neuron, which in turn activates it. This continues. This cycle continues. And look at that. So then, even if it misses, it will activate the second, next, next one, next neuron there. So this is called a reverberating circuit. So this goes on and on and on. So that means uh, the excitability continues. So that increases the central excitatory state of the spinal neurons, and that the central excitatory state makes this massive uh, reflex uh, that is responsible for the mass reflex. Okay, so now what are the key words of this topic? It is, I'm just, uh, you can consider them for your own short notes. Uh, the key words of this topic are a clonus, muscle tone, clasp knife effect, lengthened reaction, gendrasque manoeuvre, reverberating circuits, stretch reflex, reciprocal inhibitory reflex, inverse stretch reflex, withdrawal reflex, or flexor reflex, Babinski sign, crossed extensor reflex, mass reflex. I've covered uh, so many 
uh, items here and you can just try to because each of these items are a short note question for you people just to consider that now uh, in the next class i will take about the autonomic nervous system because uh, i i want to highlight the, because in this spinal cord we have the uh, sensory functions the motor functions reflex functions we, we we dealt with then autonomic reflexes because it also governs the autonomic nervous system let us consider the autonomic nervous system uh, in the next class now uh, these are the books i have uh, referenced the candles uh, principles of neuro neuroscience uh, guidance textbook of physiology and again uh, also besides that uh, the uh, shamsan wright and other books uh, uh, which I, uh, I goes uh, without telling. Now, uh, the assignment I am I'm trying to give you, the, uh, besides the assignment keywords I had given, we just try to work on the keywords. Uh, I'm just giving you a full question. Uh, name different types of spinal reflexes. Describe withdrawal reflex and a cross extensor reflex with a suitable diagram. I have given you the diagram that you try to practice. Okay, so then uh, we have the, I, I had given plantar reflex short note, mass reflex short note, muscle tone, the flexor reflexes, clonus, reverberating circuits, generic maneuver, plasmonic rigidity. Uh, I have uh, not mentioned here spasticity and uh, uh, placidity. You include those uh, aspects also. Okay, uh, that uh, ends uh, today's uh, topic. Uh, tomorrow we will go on with this thing. Thank you very much.